the major but the minor. And Dr. F. F. Bob was one of my associates and recently went home to glory, close to 100 years old. How many ever know Brother Bob? I'm sure many of you people knew him. He used to tell me, he said, well, Brother Brandon, what we use divine healing is just like the bait you put on the hook. You never show the fish the hook, you show him the bait. And when he takes the bait, he gets the hook. So that's the way we try to use divine healing. It's a gift of God, and, and then we, it attracts the people, and they see something happen that they know they could not happen unless God had done it. Therefore, it turns their attention around from the things of the world to God. And that's what the reason we say it. it's a bait that leads sinners. What our main purpose is here for is to capture the unbeliever to have faith in God. That's what we want to do, is to have, see the sinner converted to a living faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's our main thing. Next thing is to try to help the sick and needy to find help. And many of them, of course, as it is all over the world, are perfectly helpless unless God does something for them because our medical science, some of them are beyond that. And I just left home yesterday for, or day before, yeah, yesterday, where I seen the Lord take a total insane person that two years don't even know where it is at, what their name was or anything about it, and restore them in their right mind to the entire staff of the hospital said they never seen anything. A total insane person, an insane young lady, two years. And All right. just uh, when you see something like that, we know that it takes God to do that. That's just all we do. We know that man cannot do things like that, and it wasn't given to man. After all, divine healing, there's only one kind of healing, and that's divine healing. No other healing but divine healing. All healing has to come through God. Psalm 103, 3 said, I'm the Lord who heals all thy diseases. Now, medical cures, medical does not claim to cure. They only claim to assist nature. God is the one that does the healing. I was interviewed at Mayo Brothers, and that's what they told me there. So we do not claim to heal people. We only claim to assist nature while God heals. In other words, if you got a cut in your hand, well, they'll sew it up. They don't heal it. If uh, you got a bad pending, they can take the pending out. But that's all they can do. If you got a broken arm, you can set the arm. Who's going to furnish the calcium and what it takes to knit, knit that bone? It takes to rebuild cells, it takes life. And life is what makes healing. We can cut, operate, and so forth, but we cannot heal. God has to do that Himself. That's a multiplying of cells. He said, that only comes through uh, God, that's the only one who can do it. We can make a mechanical man where he can reach his hand and almost sink, but we cannot build cells. God alone does that. So he's the Lord. He heals all of our diseases. We can pull a tooth out, but who's going to stop the blood? And who's going to heal a place that come out? If God doesn't do it, he'll never be healed. That's right. Amen. What if I was out here cranking my car? Of course, that's a long time ago, I guess. In the old come back model T days. Now, when I used to crank the old car, what if I break my arm and I run into it? A physician, heal my arm right quick. I, I got to finish cranking my car. Well, he'd say you need mental healing. Well, that'd be right. He'd say, well, I, at least I can set your arm, but something higher than me has to heal it. He can set it, and that's his duty. That's what we ought to do. We won't let him set it. But God does the healing. So I do not believe that there's such a thing as a divine healer outside of God. I believe that God is the only healer. That there is. Therefore, many times people have said, Brother Bram, the divine healer. No, I'm the more divine healer than the pastor is the divine savior. So uh, we just preach the gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the good news that Christ was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was up on him, and with his stripes we were healed. Amen. That's something that's passed. Christ did all for us that was required to be done, and all that can be done is already done. I believe that the only thing we have to do is to accept what He has done, what's already done. And now, a minister, any minister, has just as much right to pray for the sick or the laity, just as much as anyone else. 
Because he said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that you might may be healed. For the affectional fervent prayer of a righteous man of daily much. I do believe that there's power in prayer. Yes. I've seen some very direct answers to prayer. But never heal anybody in my life. But I've seen God do a lot of it. <laughs> so I, I believe that it's the individual's faith in a work that's already been completed. I used to say, I'd say here tonight, how many Christians, so many hands would go up. How many were saved last year, so many hands would go up. How many were saved maybe a week ago, maybe a day two or three hands would go up. I differ. You, you was not saved a year ago, or you wasn't saved two or three days ago. You were saved 1900 years ago at Calvary. But you accepted it last year, or you accepted it last week, see, or two days ago. And the same thing by his stripes, you were healed. See, you were, past tense, healed. Now, you can accept it tonight, or you can accept it tomorrow night, or whenever you accept it, by it's yours. So, it's up to you when you want to accept it, upon those bases. And he now is a high priest, Hebrews 3, sitting at the right hand of God Almighty in heaven, making intercessions upon our confession. Now, the word used there in the book of Hebrews is used in the King James Version, is used profess, but profess and confess is the same thing. You profess something or confess it. You profess that you believe that he has, he was wounded for your transgressions with his stripes, you were healed. So he's a high priest to make intercessions upon our confession. And he cannot do nothing for us until first we accept it and confess it. Now we could get out the altar and pray until we were we laid on our faces and died. Until we believe and accept His pardoning grace, we're still lost. No matter how loud we could scream or how long we could stay or how much we could do without food, until in our heart the revelation God gives us that Jesus Christ died to save us and we accept it as our own personal property. It's something Christ did for me, He did for you, and to whosoever will believe it. Then you're saved because you have believed it. And you're healed the same way. Uh, many times people say, I, I like to feel if I'm healed. Jesus never did say, did you feel it? He said, did you believe it? That's it. Do you believe it? Feeling has nothing to do with it. It's your faith. If I did the way I felt, I'd be in bad shape a lot of times. Is that right, brother? I guess we all would. But it's not how I feel. It's what I believe that he has done. Not my feeling. It's my faith in what a finished work at Calvary. Now, in this, there's many... Perhaps this is my first time of being in your city. I believe it's my first time in Virginia of ever having a service in Virginia. Around the world seven times and yet have never been in Virginia. Isn't that awful? Well, they always say you save the best and last. Is that what it is, brother? The uh, best comes last. So we hope that that's just exactly right. All the people like those who we've met since we've been here, we certainly have met some very fine people. And maybe I've been meeting the people of just the, just the citizens, maybe not even Christians. And then what will the Christians be if the citizens is like that? Not Christians. Be wonderful. So now, a meeting can only be whatever the people will make. Now, God is willing if we are willing. But we have our part to play. Each individual has our part to play. I can no more make a, a revival out of it or a meeting than nothing. And no one individual or no just two or three of you. It'll take all of us together, working together through the Lord Jesus Christ to see something accomplished here in this city while we're gathered together for the kingdom of God's sake. And brothers and sisters, we're living near the end. We all know that. There's, there's no, with, or, if you have traveled with me in the last year or so, you, you know that's true. You see, that we're, we're in a shaking condition. And uh, the end time is near. And these things, as we go on the long of the week, we'll be presenting them, what's happening, what's just about to happen. And as you see on your newspapers, telecasts, and what more, then you'll listen from the Scripture and what the Holy Spirit has to say. Now, I suppose, I believe we usually close around 1 o'clock, isn't it, or something like that, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, usually it's about time to I don't leave. I just keep 
<laughs> I was just teasing about that. Usually we let out about 9 and 9 30. And then with the prayer. So I think that the audit custodians, I guess, will tell us no how let's know how long we can keep the offer open or clock work. Now you must get on the phone, you must get the call of the people, and, and let's tell you now, we'll tell you how that we are believe that we run the fee or with the brethren. And and remember at any time that you feel that you won't have someone to be pray for, any of these brethren here, they believe the same gospel that I'm here preaching. And your pastor just got as much right to pray for as anyone else. Here we just come together. I believe it's written in the scripture, the Lord said, If the people is called by my name, they'll assemble themselves together, pray, and I'll hear from heaven, heal their minds. So we believe that prayer is the most powerful weapon that was ever put in the care of a human being. You know, prayer one time changed the mind of God. Did you know that? It sure did. Uh, Hezekiah was told by Isaiah the prophet that he was going to die on that day. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and wept bitterly and asked the Lord for, for 15 more years of life. And God sent the prophet right back and said, I've heard it. And he is spared for the time. See, when God had already announced his death. But he spared it because of he prayed. So if prayer is that powerful, what can it do? Mine. We don't realize how great it is. Now, all along through the meeting, as each night we try to lay down the foundation. Then when someone comes in, maybe a little later on, maybe tomorrow night, and maybe the next night some newcomers come in, they might see something taking place that they say, well, I just don't understand. And if they don't, then you take the scriptures. And show them by it. Now, if you ever see any action here at the platform or anything that I speak on a platform here that's not absolutely the scripture, then you're duty bound to me as a Christian to call my attention to it. Because I do believe that God does things that's not written in the Word. I believe He can, he can do anything He wishes to. He's God. But just as long as He does what He's promised to do, that'll be enough for me. Just just keep his promise. I, I like that. And I do believe that the word of God is the foundation. I believe it is the word of God. And it's my stand, my life, and all my faith is based on the word. And here's the way I want you to believe it now. That God is, is infinite. He's omnipresent, omnipotent, and he's almighty God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot change and be God. And whatever God does one time, makes his decision, that decision has to remain forever. It can never be changed. God, if God makes a decision this year, and next year he changes that, that shows that he wasn't God. Because he's infinite. And we are finite. Now we can make a, a decision, I can make one tonight and ten minutes have to change it because I'm, I'm wrong man, so many times. You are also, but not God. So if he ever makes a decision, then that's got to be forever his decision. It's like this, if a man ever come to God and know he was lost and wanted to be saved and God asked him to place the basis upon him, he'd believe it, and he saved that man... The next man comes and wants salvation. He's got to do the same for this man that he did then. He's got to act the same here as he did there or he acted wrong in the first place. Amen. See? He's got to remain God. His, and if this isn't his word, then he isn't God. See, because this is what he said. And if he doesn't keep his word, then he cannot have his word. No man is worth any more than his word is. If, I, if my handshake and my promise to my brethren isn't enough, that I have to sign a lot of papers and a lot of this, that, that that's mistrusting. I, I just, you have to take me for what I tell you, and I have to take you for what you tell me. And if, and if we cannot trust one another, then if my word's no good, then I'm no good. And if God's word's no good, then he's no good. He's no better than his word. And I'll say this, that God keeps every word that he said and ever promised. 
And if you'll take the right mental attitude towards any divine promise God ever made, He'll bring it to pass. If you can just take the right attitude and believe it with all your heart. See, the individual, it isn't what you have to have somebody that lay hands on you with a certain sensation. Oh my, there's so many sensations today. It couldn't be right. But God's word still right. See, it's right. The sensations I have don't know nothing about them, but I do know that the word of God is right. So therefore, when God says anything, it must ever remain that way. And that's the way I believe it. I've studied it and history and what he said would take place and through the ages and the church ages and so forth. And Sid just dovetailed together to I'm satisfied that he's God and every word is true. And he keeps his word with his people. Now, the way we do, uh, by evening, along about an hour before the services start, so it won't interfere with the preliminaries, we send the boys down and give an individual prayer cards. And each evening we do that because first, here's the way we did it. When we first started out, well now, of course, if it just like this year, well, we wouldn't even have to give a prayer card with a little group like this, see. But when we have great groups, which we expect to fill and pack the place out in that so. Now, we just left Ben Daly, Vazali it was, Hill in uh, California, and the first night, the big armory there, they turned away hundreds and hundreds, and the second night doubled it more and more. We went to a fairgrounds, and there's enough people there at 3 o'clock to close the gates before you even get into the places, you see. Just when the meeting gets started, and people begin to, the hungry hearted begin to see that, well, it's, it's the Holy Spirit moving among the people, see. It, it isn't some preacher with a, some high, super duper faith. I don't believe in those things. I believe that faith comes by hearing the word of God and the individual ought to straighten his life up and get right with God if he expects to get healed. I, I believe the healing's last thing is that the individual's got to get straight with God. All this laying hands on the sinners and telling them, that's all right, just forget about it, God will heal you anyhow. Now, I don't believe in that. I believe a man ought to clean up and get right with God and straighten up and come on and live for God and do what's right. And that's last and healing. These 31 years, I have noticed that's true, that the man or woman that's ready to come straight with God, God will come straight with man. But Amen. You have to straighten up with God. So then, the reason we do this, when we first started, we used to send the pastors, each pastor that was cooperating, a hundred cards. Well, for his congregation and for those who would be inviting and the sick people and so forth, well, then, about the first pastor, many of you have been in the meetings before, of course, I guess. About the first pastor got his group up, that settled. So he couldn't do it that way. So then we thought, well, we'd uh, just uh, give out prayer cards the first day we was there and give everybody out prayer cards. And then, that, of course, that settled it. If anybody come otherwise on the first day, why, then they didn't get a chance to get the prayer because we had enough there to last. So then uh, we went to giving out prayer cards each day and then uh, when we get up maybe 15 or 20 whatever we got that night well then just on the platform of what we could get on there then we found out the people if they wouldn't get some number of the card up to 15 or 20 they just throw it on the floor they didn't want it they wouldn't be caught so then I thought well I'll get some little child along the front here to let him come up here and count some little boy like this little lad looking at here with the red on the sport coat and uh, I, uh, about the size of my little Joseph over there, and I, I get one of those little fellows to come up, and I say, can you count, Sonny, or sister? Yes. Count. And he start counting, or she, and wherever they stop, I'd start right there. Believe it or not, Mama knows just exactly where to tell Junior to stop at for her card, so we still got human beings, you know, we're dealing with them. And so then, then I got this one minister, I got to give out cards, and and then, in his organization, if he didn't show us a little bit of favor, he started some feeling with the brethren. Then I got my brother to give out prayer cards. Or before that, I got another man who picked up an outsider. And I called him selling prayer cards. So then, I had to get rid of that, so I got my brother with me. And, he, 
And so now I got my son with me, and then two boys. One of them is one of my associates, Brother Gene Gold. I guess he's been introduced to Brother Leo Mercer. He's here somewhere. And my son, Billy Paul, they're here somewhere. Either of those will be giving out prayer. Or Jesus, even Billy does it himself, because Leo and Gene, Gene stands with the recorders, and, and uh, Brother Leo, I think, is on the books. Now, then we give out those, and now here's the way we do it, so that each one will know. We come down here and get the cards and come down before the people and mix them all up, right up here on the platform, so you see the cards are mixed up. Therefore, the, ever who's giving them out, he doesn't know who's getting, who's getting what number. Why don't you get around and say, I got number one. That means, yes, sir. Next to say, I'm number two over here. Of course, this might get one, and next to him might get 45. And, 62 and so forth, you don't know where it'll be. Well then, see, you say, well, I, well if I didn't get number one to 15, I might as well go home. No, no, that's not it. See, no one knows that when I come down. Wherever the Holy Spirit needs me to start, maybe from 1 to 20, or from 20 to 60, or from 90 back to 30, or somewhere like that. So therefore, it's just, we just deal with that way. It's the way the Holy Spirit has a way of working it. To bring them in, I think that's just exactly, don't you, brethren, you think that's it? I've been doing that now for the last, oh, four or five years or six, something like that. And so by and by, when you get your prayer card, hold on to it, because if you're not called on the first night, we will finally get to it at the end. Now, and then that, that prayer card, we call it so much each night, if I, the Lord leads me to do the way we just had the greatest success I ever had in America, if I... Doing it this way just recently. And now, what time does your main service start? About 7 30? 7 30. Better be here between 6 30 and 7 o'clock, then I guess, or something like that. Or 6 30 to 7 30. Don't make it any later than this. Better come as early as you can because as soon as so many cards just give out, well, that's, that's it. Then you get them, get your loved ones, your sick friends, and bring them down. Get them on the phone tomorrow. Come on down and get the prayer card tomorrow. Tomorrow evening between 6.30 and 7.30 at the uh, main auditorium. You don't have afternoon services, no worry, I suppose, brother. All right. Sometimes they get like that in the afternoon service and they don't have food at, at night. But if we are uh, in some church or somewhere, but if they do it this way, it'll be all right. Just go on down tomorrow evening between 6.30 and 7.30. And then we expect to have services each night. I'll speak each night, the Lord willing, the manager, nobody, just the boys and I are up here. And so we are, and uh, we will try then each night to pray for the sick, call sinners to the altar, work with our brethren to everything that we possibly can to make this uh, starting of a revival, an old-fashioned revival and shake to Virginia that life has never done before for the kingdom of God's sake. Every church to be filled and packed and God servants uh, preaching the gospel like never before, and sinners coming to Calvary, and sick people being healed in every church, and the glory of God going everywhere. That's our heart's desire. Now, I'm glad I got this little clock over here. I hope it's just about, it is right. So, as according to my watch. So now, I want to just read a scripture and make a little call for you tonight. And now, remember, we're up here for nothing else. We're not here to represent any denomination. Because I, I do not belong to any denomination church. I was ordained a missionary Baptist minister. And I pastored the tabernacle of Jeffersonville for 17 years. And then I went on the mission field about 15 years ago. And uh, I've been on the field ever since. And when I come out praying for the sick, I just left the church, left the organization because out here I, I get everything uh, all together and then I I feel that that's the way the Lord got his children everywhere every man that's born again the spirit of God is my brother and every woman is my sister that's born to the spirit of God so I don't represent any certain organization if I was here in the city to the converts I'd join one of these fine churches here that believes the same thing that I believe so that's the way I, I do it myself. You have your own choice to do whatever you wish to. And then we're not here for money. I want you to know that. We're not here for money. No, sir. I am 51 years old. I've been a minister for 31 years. 
And I preached 17 years at the Baptist Tabernacle of Jefferson Billingham. Never took an offering in all my life. I preached 17 years without one penny of anything. Any of the trustees could tell you that. Never took a penny. I worked for my living. I wouldn't even do it now if I could afford to pay these meetings off. The only thing I do is come out here and hold the meeting, and the only thing you have to do is pay the expense of the building or whatever expenses goes with the meeting is all I'm concerned about. Just pay the thing off, and that, that's it. Don't owe me nothing. We got books, but them books I buy, those books at 40% less, not, not because it's a money-making thing, because I lose them, but get the message out to the people. The tapes are from the Audio Mission, another group that's not with us. It's, well, they're making the tapes for the tabernacle, which they, in some kind of collaboration there, they can make the tapes by. But for myself, no. Sometimes at the end of the meeting, if all the debts is paid off, they give me a love offering. If they don't have the debts paid off, they don't give me nothing. And if they do give me a love offering, I turn it back into to to pay the debts. We want to leave the city without one penny being owed. If we have to send home, get the money, somewhere we'll do it. See, but we don't leave any debts. Never have yet. We want to keep our name clean and clear and in above board because we're meeting the sick people. We're meeting Satan on his grounds and we, we want to have our hands clean that when we come to pray for the sick that we'd be honest and just and nothing shady. We're standing right before God as his servants. We want to keep just fair and clean and clear with everybody. And I want you to know then that there's no pulls for money and there's no nothing about that. We, we're not here for that. And uh, we just love you and come to fellowship with you. And uh, as Brother Bosworth said to me one day, he said, Brother Brandon, do you know what fellowship is? And I said, I think so, doctor. I said, I think I, well, I said, just what it is. It's two fellows in one ship. And I said, that's about a great answer for it. Two fellows in one ship. So, we're Desiring that we can come into your little boat and you can come into our boat. We can have fellowship one with another while we're singing across the city here to pull every lost soul that we can into the kingdom of God. Let's bow our heads now before we speak to the altar, before we read his word. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to thee tonight for this privilege of standing our first time in this great state of Virginia. How many years ago our forefathers landed here. This great state has meant much to our union. Lord, I pray that somehow that in this great state now that you'll break forth a revival that will be known around the world. May there come forth an issue from God, a fiery spirit of the Holy Ghost that will save the lost and heal the sick. Let the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the dumb to talk. Sinners be saved in the kingdom of God, every church just illuminated with thy presence. Until around the world they'll hear from this great being. Now we can ask for it, Lord, and believe it. Now help us to work for that evening. For it would be so unnecessary to ask you anything and not, not work for it. Believe that, you, that you'll do it. We'll wait with expectations that you will grant it to us. And when the services is closed on next Sunday afternoon, may there be a pile of wheelchairs laying in the corner there. Cot stretchers. May there be sinners washed in the blood of the Lamb with their hands up in the air, praising God. May the clergy, your precious shepherds who feed your sheep, may their hearts be so on fire that I can do the ministry be given to them. Grant it, Lord. Bless every church and every minister throughout the country, every saint, and save the sinner. As we approach thy word now for just a little uh, foundation to start the meeting on tonight, we pray that you will bless it. We know that our words will fail, but your words cannot fail. So as we read your word, we pray that you'll interpret it to us by the Holy Spirit. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, don't forget now. Get on the phone. 
somewhere, get the sick people out, those who are really need, and a prayer card will be given. Now, you, you must obtain a prayer card. It'll have a number on it, a letter and a number. Each evening, those prayer cards will be given out. And from 6.30 until 7.30, and then they'll be called with those numbers. That's to keep the people from rushing up. It isn't an arena, you know, it's a, it's a church. And it must be done in order, as Paul said, decently and in order. And so we want them just to come as their numbers are called and minister to at the platform. Now these prayer cards are not inexchangeables. In, in you have to maintain your own card. You can't take it, give it to a neighbor, and bring the neighbor in. The neighbor must come and hear the instruction in order to get the card. If goes many times that way, if you bring people in the prayer line that know nothing about God, and there you are again, you see it. And so let them come and hear the instructions and have their own faith built up to a place to receive their healing as we pray for the sick. That'll be tomorrow afternoon now between 6.30 and 7.30. I wish to read from St. Luke, the second chapter, 25th and uh, 26th verses. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Sin. The same was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was up on him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. I like to use for context or for a text or to build a context on expectations. Now, such meetings draw expectations. And, and when you see uh, something uh, unusual going on, we usually have three classes of people that attend those services, like it was in the days of our Lord and our all times. There is the unbeliever. The make-believer and the believer. It just attracts those attentions. It's always been. But expectancy, that's a great thing to expect something. You usually get what you expect. Some people come to the meeting and say, well, uh, I didn't didn't expect this. Get anything out of it. Well, they won't. (laughs) But those who expect to get something, God will give them their expectations. If they're doing it reverently, And in the fear of God. Now always to find out something first is to find whether it's the will of God or not. And then if it's the will of God, then you're objecting objecting to it. And then your motive in doing it. If it's the will of God and your objective is right and your motive is right, it's got to happen. There's just no way to keep it from happening. So first find the will. If it's God's will... And then, what, what's your objective in doing it? What's, if, you, if it's selfish, you'll, you'll, never, you'll, you'll never get it done, that's all. It's got to be real clean and clear before God or it just won't happen, that's all. It's, you've got to always keep that on your mind. That It's got to be clean and clear, your cuts must be clean and clear before God or God cannot work with you. Now, man of all times is always that's heard God. And wherever God is, supernatural is, because He is a supernatural God working supernatural things. Do you believe that? Now, in the Old Testament, they had a way of finding out whether a message was right or not. Uh, Under the Levitical priesthood, they had what they called the Urim Thunder. And that was the breastplate that Aaron had here. He had the twelve tribal stones in the breastplate. And they hung that on the corner or the post in the temple and then when the prophet prophesied or the dreamer told his dream and when he was telling it if that light become a conglomeration of lights like a rainbow reflecting off of that Urimathun was showing that the supernatural was there then that prophet was telling the truth or that dreamer's dream was right however no matter how real it sounded I keep this in mind. No matter how real it sounded, if that Urim of Thunder didn't make the supernatural light, they could not receive it because it wasn't God. So when you see anyone preaching the gospel that God doesn't come down and confirm that to be right, you leave it alone. Because it's not right. God still remains God. He lives today just as much alive as He ever was. He's God. Now, now, 
when that priesthood was done away with, then we got the new priesthood, and now there has the new new, new year of abundance that also with this priesthood, and that is God's word. God's word is God's year of abundance. Then, if God promises anything in the Bible, and you can accept it with all your heart and believe it to be so, you'll see the supernatural of God's word take place and manifest the thing that you have believed for. No matter what it is, if you believe it, the word of God is a seed. It's sowed into the human heart, and if there's nothing there to to hinder it, it's like when God makes a decision, it's his ultimatum. And if you have an ultimatum, God is the same. When that two comes together, something got to happen. You just can't keep from happening. See? When your ultimatum is the same as God's, then something must take place. God makes a statement, it's got to be that. Then when you take your stand and that is true, something has to take place. It's just, it's got to. And man in all ages, when they have heard the voice of God speaking to them, they have... They have seen the supernatural and they have expected and lived their life expecting this to happen and never did it ever fail. Abraham expected that baby to come. Even down to 25 years after it was promised to him, he was still expecting it. Just the same when he was 100 years old as he did when the promise was made in 75. And the Bible said that he never got weak, but he got stronger all the time. Believe God would do it. Could you imagine an old man now 75 years old and a, a woman of 65, she was barren and he was sterile. And here they went out now was going to go down to doctor, to hospital to make arrangements for a, a bed. They're going to have a baby. Yep. A 65 year old woman and a 75 year old man. What would the doctor say to the poor old couples, a little off at their head? Well, now, anybody that really takes God's word and that face value is considered a little off of the head. Because it's so supernatural, the natural world doesn't know nothing about it. It's foolish to the carnal mind. So you'll never understand it. But Abraham believed it. He said it's true, and he believed it was. I can hear him as he would say to Sarah, now we're going to have this baby, honey. It's settled because God said so. She bought up the bird eye and the pins and got everything ready and made the booties and was all ready. And after the first so many days, 28 days, how you feeling here? No different, honey. Praise God, we're going to have it anyhow. <laughs> first month passed, no different. Second month, first year, second year. How you feeling, darling? No different. Glory to God, it's going to be a bigger miracle than it was two years ago. It's two years older now. And when 25 years had passed, he still had the same attitude. Just the same because God said so. How do you know? God said so. That's it. God said so. That is no more to be said about it. See? He said so. And at a hundred years old, he still believed God. And God was good. The Bible said in Hebrews 4 that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God to unbelief, but was strong giving praise to God. And we are supposed to be Abraham's seed. For we who are dead in Christ are Abraham's seed. Is that right? The Holy Spirit makes us Abraham's seed. Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was a Gentile. But it wasn't Jew nor Gentile. It was his faith in God's word is what made him to be the the heir of the promise. And we be dead in Christ, our Abraham's seed, and our heirs with him according to the promise. I tell you, that's true, we are, but sometimes we don't act like it. Amen. Sometimes we go and say, well, I'll, we'll be prayed for and I'll see what happens. Well, I don't feel a bit different. Abraham, see. Oh, my. That's a poor excuse for, even for a church member, let alone be an Abraham seed. Abraham seed, don't look at those circumstances. It looks at the Word of God. That's all. Here some time ago, I was called to a bedside about 10 years ago to, well, it's been about 12 years ago now, to a dying boy, dying with black diphtheria. And uh, the doctor wouldn't let me go in. He said, I can't let you go in. You're married here. And the doctor was Catholic himself. And I said, now, if uh, the priest came and this boy was dying in here and you knew he said he was going to die tonight, and you, would you let that priest go in? He said, sir, give him the last rites. Yes, sir. And I, I knew he would. My background's Catholic too. And so I said, I, I, I knew he would do that. And I said, well, now, he said, yes, but he, he's not a married man. You've got children. You packed this to children. You got two little children. I said, 
Yes, sir, that's true. But I said, my faith in God. He said, God, get out. And I said, well, now look, that I, I'm just as much to that boy in there, according to his father and mother standing here, as the priest would be to you if you were not. See, I said, just as much. Our faith looks to God just in the same way. Finally, he dressed me up like a Ku Klux and let me go in. So I, I went in to pray for the boy. And the boy was there and a little nurse went over with us. The old father and mother knelt across the other side of the bed. They had him pulling his hair back and forth in him. And uh, artificial respiration. And they said, uh, uh, they, uh, I knelt down and prayed. This is a common little prayer. Laid hands on the boy. and said, Lord, you promised that you would do this. And his father and mother believes this. So I'm laying my hands up on the boy. And you said these signs shall follow them that believe if they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Therefore, Lord, in my heart, I believe that you keep your word. And so does his father and mother. It is finished, Father. Thank you. Raise up and the old dad grabbed the mother and the mother grabbed the daddy and began to hug one another. And this cry said, isn't it wonderful, honey? Isn't it wonderful? And the boy never made a move. He'd been unconscious for three days. And said, oh, isn't it wonderful? And I said, the Lord bless you all. And started walk out a little and I went on out, and they un- taken that all off of me out there so I could go on. So then the little nurse came up, and she said, Mister, she said, I just can't understand. She's just a girl. She said, I can't understand. You see some kind of a cartogram or something. And said, if that ever drops down at a certain place, that all the history has never been known to ever rise again. And said, the only thing's keeping that boy here, he's weeping all the time. said, he's just dying, he's just dying right now. And said, when he, that man, made that prayer for that uh, baby, or that boy, said, he's about 12 years old, 14, said, you, said, it didn't change him a bit. Said, he's not changed one bit. And said, that needle's still hanging right down here. And said, he's just like he was. And said, uh, it never can come up no more because it's down and that's all. And the old gentleman, the old fatherly like, put his arms around the little nurse. And he said, oh, my precious child. He said, the Lord bless you, honey. He said, I don't uh, uh, want to make fun of you because, and I wouldn't disagree with what you're saying. He said, but you see, he said, oh, you've been trained to believe that when that needle or hand or what it is goes down there, that it can never come back again. She said, sir, that is the truth. She said, it, it cannot come back again. He said, the boy's gone. He said, he's just barely here. And said, he take this off of him and he'd die right now. He said, honey, he said, you're looking for that needle. Said that she, she had just asked him, said, how can you laugh and go on like that in your boy dying? He said, he's not dying. He said, he's healed. He said, well, how can you expect that? And that needle said, honey, that's all you know to look at is that needle. But I'm looking at a promise. That God made it. And that boy has got two children and he's an Africa Day a missionary. Oh, it depends on what you're looking at. He was expecting it to happen because he had met God's requirements. He laid the boy on the altar. He had medical science had done all they could do. Everything was past any physical aid that could be given the boy. So he come to God and believed that God would do him. And the Bible said he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That's right. You seek him with all your heart and get down to business. God will be there to meet you. That's right. But you have to not just kind of slough way through. You've got to come right straight to God and confess everything and lay it out and come on those grounds and God will meet you there and He'll do something for you. He'll answer your prayers. Every man that ever believed in God or heard God's voice expected Him to do something. When God spoke to Noah in the Old Testament, now there's never been any rain on the earth. Why there's uh, God watered the earth up through before the antediluvian destruction? Why He watered it through irrigation up through the earth? It never rained. And God spoke to, to Noah and told him to prepare an ark for the saving of his house. That it was going to rain. Rain was going to come out of the skies, and the whole earth is going to be covered with water. And Noah was expecting that to happen. If he would not have expected the first critic come by, he would have said, well, I guess maybe I was wrong. It wasn't God. See, so he'd have went away. Now, that's about the way that the 1961 version of the church would have. But that's not really a real born again Christian. When God says so, we expect it to be that way. God said it, and that's the way it's going to be. It's just got to be that way. He said, you know why we're that why we are the way we are today? How the church is lukewarm, this lady will see in church age? 
Why? Well, God said it would be that way. You can't expect nothing else. It's got to be that way. That's right. But he's got all that he loves. He chastens and rebukes. Not stand at the door or knock. And if any man will hear my voice. That's the address to this church age. By God in the Bible. Uh, Revelation the third chapter. To the Lady of Sin Church age. Now, we notice that Noah was prepared. A self an ark. Moved by fear. And made, made an ark. Stood in that door preaching to the unbelievers. But he was expecting God to keep his promise because he had heard the voice of God telling him that it was going to rain. Now, if you can sit right where you are now and so consecrate yourself to God and expect God to do something, hear the voice of God whisper down in your heart, you don't have to wait for a prayer card tomorrow night. This is the time I'm going to hear it. That's all. It's settled. There would be nothing to be able to shake you from that. If you've never received the Holy Spirit and you say, Lord, I've sought the Holy Spirit for years, but I just heard a voice tell me I'm going to get it right tonight. That settles it. That, that's it. You'll be so expected it'll have to happen. Now Noah was stood it there pounding away on that ark because he was expecting it to rain. Now let's just take a, a moment and find the critics coming by and say, well, now, just a moment, sir. Mr. Noah, you tell me it's going to rain. Yes, sir. Now, I'm a scientist, which they had scientists. Scientists come through Cain's group. So he said, now, we, uh, we're scientists, and, and uh, we'd like for you to show us where that rain is up there. Now, faith is not what you can see, but it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God said so. We don't have to prove nothing. Proving is nothing. You can't prove God. You can't even prove you've got a mind. That's true. You can't do it. If you do, let me see it. Taste it, feel it, smell it, or hear it. You ever feel your mind? See your mind? Taste your mind? See, the senses won't declare it. But yet you've got one. You know you have. And that's just the way it is by God. You say, how do I know i got a mind? I see the way I act. I know the way that something changed me from a sinner to a Christian. I've got a God. But I know it. it's, it's real. Just as real as your mind is or... Or, or any other sense that would operate. Now, notice, there's five senses that we enter the human body. Five senses. The soul has five outlets too, which is uh, conscience and so forth and imagination. But there's only one entrance to the spirit. That soul, body, and spirit to the spirit. And that's down the avenue of self-will. Which puts every man and every woman on the same basis it was in the Garden of Eden. You want to do, you got a, your free moral agent to act any way you wish to. And none of these other senses has anything to do with it, neither soul nor body, but it's through the Spirit on self-will. God told Adam, the day you eat there, the day you die. Now he could eat and live, or he, he, could, he could eat and die, or stay away from it and live. That's the same way we are tonight. We can take His Word and be healed, or we can leave it, walk away from it, and not be healed. We can have eternal life by believing on Him, or we can walk away and not have eternal life. It's up to you. Self-will. And when Noah heard the voice of God telling him it is going to rain, and the clouds is coming, and it's going to rain, and never had did it in all the ages, and, and but it's going to rain... Noah knew this, that God was creator God, that he could, he could do anything he wanted to do. And therefore, he, he was God and there was nothing else to it. He just knew that, that he was able to make rain up there if there wasn't any up there. And he's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provided himself a sacrifice. So God can make rain if there's no clouds up there, no rain up there. If he said it's going to rain, Noah said, I'll just build right away on this ark anyhow. For he was expecting it to rain. And when he got the ark built, everything was in order. It rained because he was believing. Now, it makes you act funny when you, when you really take God at his word. And when you're acting like you expect it. I see people come platform and say, Well, look, I'm sick, man. Don't you know that? Well, sure I know you're sick. All right. Well, can you do something? Well, you'll, you'll never get it that way. No, sir. And uh, you'll pray for them, lay hands on them, walk off platforms. <laughs> Don't feel a bit different, huh? You won't. That's one thing, sir. You won't. Now, you wasn't expecting anything. 
You come to the platform and follow out God's instructions just the way God says. Then go away. You got expectations. Yes, sir. I'm going to receive it. It's already done. I did what God told me to do. So that's settled. That's that's the way. That's Abraham. See. Now we take another Moses. Moses. Oh, he was a trained theologian. He really knew because he could he could teach the Egyptians uh, wisdom. He was so smart, and he knew that he was born. Raised up to be a deliverer of Israel, so he thought he could take his theological training and really go out there and do it. But he found out he was a failure. And when we try to uh, educate the church to fellowship, when we try to educate the people to Christ, we are just batting the air. We'll never get no work. There's only one way that a man or woman can come to Christ. That's through the blood of Jesus Christ by being born again. That's the only avenue that we can walk. When you come into that, then you receive genuine Holy Spirit faith that makes you call anything contrary to God's promise as though it was, wasn't there. Amen. No matter what the circumstances is, how sick you are, what the doctor said, he give you up, you're going to die with cancer, you got heart trouble, might go at any minute. You don't even look at that, you look at what God said. Amen. You stay right there on what God said. That, he said that, that settles it all the time. I can't bluff it, you've got to really believe it. And you say, oh yes, I believe it. Oh, I've seen people say that and the faith was ink, they couldn't dot an eye. They just, just simply just worked up its hope instead of faith. Genuine faith don't take no for an answer. It's, it's got hairs on the chest. It's big and burly. It speaks and everything else sets down. That's all. If the old, you know, feeling trees up say, you, you don't feel any difference. Uh, you, you just, you say, shut up, faith will. Shut down. Amen. Drop up over. <laughs> that's it. Now, that's it. Well, your stomach's still hurting. Shut up! Don't even feel it. <laughs> That's it. All right. That's, don't don't feel it. Sure. It's looking at what God said. God said so, so faith believes it. You can just hold faith on me. That, just let faith take over. It makes the rest of them just look like little dwarfs. It just makes them sit down because he's the boss. Got great big brawny muscles. Now I tell you, everything else, all feelings and superstitions and little isms and things just sets down when faith takes over. He just needs the boss. That's right. Now, and there, uh, of course, Moses thought that he had that. But when he went in his own way and he found out he made an error and he went back and married a beautiful little Ethiopian woman and had a son back there, Gershom, and he had settled down to a good uh, life to raise his sheep and knew that he'd be heir as soon as Jeff would die and he'd have all the herds himself and so he was pretty well satisfied. But one day, he's walking back on the back side of the desert, and there's something happened that never did happen in the seminary. There was something that happened that he'd never heard of before. He'd seen a bush burning. He just went aside to see what it was. And a boy spoke out there and said, Take off your shoes, Moses. The ground you're standing on is holy. Oh, my. I've heard the cries of my people. I've seen their affliction. I remember my word. I remember what I told Abraham. What his seed would sojourn for 400 years in a strange land. That time's up. I remember my word. All right, Moses, I'm sending you down. Could you imagine a man so cowardly that he run from the nation, got in trouble for killing one man, and run from the nation, went back down to the power of God and killed a whole nation and never got in trouble? See, it goes to show where you're doing it in God's will out there in your own will. See, what you can do and get in trouble with your own self, why don't you just let loose, let God do it. That, that's the way to do it. So here he was the next day. You talk about something uh, radical. You can see Moses the next day now. After being an old sheep herder, he's, he's 80 years old, perhaps a long white beard and his head bald and, and a little crooked stick in his hand with the mule with his wife sitting straddling with the young and on her hip. Here she's going down like this, just a hooping and a holler, going down. Glory to God. Going down to Egypt. Where are you going, Moses? Going down to Egypt to take over. Yes, sir. What? A one-man invasion? Yes, sir. That's right. Wow. How you know you're going to do it? God said so. That's it. I heard his voice. I'm expecting him to do it. That's right. Look silly. Somebody said, poor old fella. A one-man invasion. Going like one man going to whip Russia. You see? But he did it. Because God said so. And he was expecting God to keep his word. Hey, Amen. I'm expecting God to keep his word with us. God will keep his word with any man that will take his word. And say, it's mine. God, you make the promise. I'm expecting you to do it. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm standing right here. 
Like Buddy Robinson when he was plowing with his old mule out there one day and the mule ran away and he bit him on the ear and he's trying to preach sanctification. And he said, I, I, I'm not a pretty looking thing here with mule hair all in my teeth and preaching sanctification. And so he got out of the field and he said, Lord, if you don't give me the Holy Ghost when you come back, you'll find a pile of bones laying right here when you come back. Now he got the Holy Ghost, so that uh, the second blessing he called it sanctification. So now that's the way when you get that to God, this is it. This settles it. God, you said so. That's all. Doctors have done everything for me they can, and I'm a hopeless case in the hands of medicine. I'm a hopeless case in the hands of the hospital. There's only one I'm giving you myself. I'm in your hand now. God, I'm on your hand. Amen. Stay right there. Something's going to happen, man. Something's fixed to happen. When you hear that voice of God tell you, you're mine. I, I own you. I bought you with my blood. Amen. I'll buy my stripes. You were healed. Oh, brother. Amen. I'm telling you, something's fixing to happen when you do that. All right. Yeah, it'll, all the people say, well, Lucy, Nettie, Martha, Mary. Well, you know, they've lost their mind. I, I tell you, they went up to a meeting up there. It was anointed. And now, you know, we know she was dying with cancer. The doctor says she can't get well. And here she's over doing all over washing. Just a singing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Walking around there carrying on like that. Well, the poor woman's gone crazy. No, she's just told God at his word. She acts crazy to the people, but she's obeying what God said. That's right. Exactly. Moses did that. Here he goes. Could you imagine? This old fella limping on one foot. Here he goes. View behind him. Glory. Hallelujah. Where are you going, Moses? Going down to Egypt. Going to take over. <laughs> going right down to take over. Eighty years old. Going down to the best mechanized army there was in the world. At the whole world conference. Going down eighty years old with a wife and a kid. It's, it's boy, Gershom. Probably sitting on her hip. And here she goes down there. Leading this old mule going down to, to take over. And he did it. Yeah. Why? He was expecting to. Why? God said so. That's said. God said so. That was John, when he walked out there and he was standing on the banks of the Jordan, standing preaching, and the priest across the bank said, Do you mean to tell me that I'll come a day when the daily sacrifice will be taken away from the temple? And there won't be any more sacrifices, obligations all day? He said, There'll come a day that there will be one come that'll be the sacrifice. Hold oh, it next to yourself, preacher. What's the matter with you? There'll be no such a time as that. And he started to look. He said, Behold! Amen. <laughs> Behold, the Lamb of God will take away the sin of the world. Why? Wow. He was expecting me because he said, He that told me in the wilderness to go baptize with water, set upon whom I can see the Spirit descending and remaining on. He's the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. That's the one. He was expecting to see him. He said, I knew him because there was a sign of the Messiah above him, a light above him, and I knew that was the Messiah. And he was expecting to see him. Whole church, we ought to be expecting to see God do something. We ought to expect to see a citywide revival, a shaking amongst the people. Certainly, it's promised to us. We believe in it. You believe with me. If we'll put our hearts together and believe something's going to happen, it's got to happen. Amen. Expecting it. Certainly. Oh, how we could go on. How uh, we could just go on with different ones. But let's get to Simeon now in closing the next few minutes. Simeon, he was a great man. I uh, read on him not long ago, he's around somewhere he's 80 years old, an old sage, well liked amongst the people, but always have been a spiritual man. And so one day he come out saying, I'm not going to die till I see the Lord's Christ. Now uh, could you imagine, you say, how do you say that, Simeon? What makes you say that? You're going off on the deep end. What kind of an ism have you got into? None. Why do you, what makes you say that? The Holy Ghost told me. The Holy Ghost revealed it to me Amen. that I wasn't going to see death until I seen the Lord's Christ and I believed it. That's all. Go around telling everybody, no matter how great his name was, he didn't have to be a blue blood, but he just, he just, I don't care what he was, he still believed that the Holy Ghost was right. Amen. Well, there's no two Holy Ghosts, there's only one Holy Ghost. That's right. And he was led by the Holy Ghost, revealed to me by the Holy Ghost. And the same Holy Spirit that revealed it to Simeon can reveal it to you. The promise that he made. Amen. There he is. Now we find him. Here he is going around telling everybody, yep, I'm not going to die. I, I'm not going to die until I see the Lord's Christ. I can hear the congregation saying, poor old Simeon. 
It's such a pity, poor old fella. You know, he's kind of a little bit, he's got one foot in the grave right now, 80 something years old, ready to die. And look, even come back in the day of Adam, he looked for the Christ. Look, David looked for him, sang of him, prophets prophesied of him, and all this. And here, this old man, now we're farther away from him than we ever was in all of our life. And here, this old man was one foot in the grave, just about to go. And here he goes around amongst the people saying, Nope, I'm not going to die. We see the Lord Christ. It's right at hand. How do you know? The Holy Ghost told me so. He was expecting it. That's right. Expect it to be done. Well, if you if you expect it to be done, then it's going to be done. Just like a, I've often said, when the deep calls to the deep, David says, the noise of, the, of thy water spouts, the deep calling to the deep. There's something about uh, something that you long, something's in your heart. I, I love the, the uh, scenes and I love honey. I grew up in the mountains since I was a little boy. Climb up there and watch that sun go down in the evening. Watch it rise in the morning. See that great eye of God look like you move across through there? Watch springtime coming now. The little seeds that was buried on that snow here a few weeks ago. Burst it. Run out. The pulp run out of them. There's nothing left. No seed, no pulp, no stalk, no petal, no nothing left of that flower. The, the, even the seed, it fell off of it. You know God has a few possession for His flowers? Did you know that? Sure. The, little, the frost hits a little flower, young or old. It bows its little head and dies. That's dead. And now that little flower drops a little black seed on the ground. Then here comes September, October comes along. Then the tear drops begins to fall out of them. October rains, you know, and buries it in the ground. Human possession, see? And it lays there all through the winter and it rots. And, and then the freeze comes and bursts the little seed open. The pulp runs out of it. And you might get a handful of that dirt and take it down to the laboratory. You couldn't take any chemicals in the world and ever find that germ of life in there. But it's there somewhere. It's right. It's hid. You can't find it. But just let the, the, uh, the sun, the sun brings forth all botany life. Now, when that sun begins to shine, that life will come forth again. I tell you what, you go out here and lay your concrete wall this, this year. Just lay it down through the yard. And where's your grass the thickest at the next year? Where is it? Where is it anytime? Right around the edge of the wall. Why is it? It's that life that's laying under that concrete. And when that sun, though it's shaded from it, when that sun begins to shine, that life will work its way right around and gets out the end of that sidewalk and stick its head up to praise God. While the sun's a shining, it's a master, it's a life giver to all body life. It, no matter where it's at, it'll shine forth again. That light will just keep working its way, working its way, working its way till it finally gets out of there. To raise its head and glorify God. Then how can anybody not believe in the resurrection? Oh, why not? Not S-U-N of God, but S-O-N of God. Eternal life. You might bury me in the sea. You can bury me on anything you want to. But when that S-O-N begins to shine forth and it's coming, everyone that's dead in him to have eternal life will rise and go with him. This is certain as I'm standing in this pool tonight. It's many times. A year not long ago, there was a, a little boy in our city that the teacher told his mother, said, you have to look at this kiddo. said, he just eats erasers off the pencil just as fast as you get him for him. Eating the razor off. And then his mammy found him out there eating the pedal off of a bicycle on the back porch. Just had him a gastronomical jubilee, just eating a pedal off of a bicycle. Well, they picked the little fellow up and took him down to the, to the clinic to have him examined. The doctors looked him over and took an analysis of, of his body. And come to find out the little fellow, the body was calling for sulfur. He is sulfur in there. His body was calling for sulfur. And sulfur is in rubber. So that's why he was getting on that rubber. Now, before there could have been something in here called for sulfur, there had to first be a sulfur to respond to that call or there never would have been a call for sulfur. In other words, before there was a tree to grow in the earth, there had to be an earth first for the tree to grow in or there would be no tree. Before there's a fish, a pin on a fish's back, there had to be a water first to swim there. He never had no fish. See? That's right. In other words, there has to be a creator to create the creation. And when in your heart, how many believe divine healing? Raise your hand. Well, now as thank you. As sure as you believe in divine healing, there's something in your inside you here telling you there's a God that heals. And before that, even that creation could be in you, there has to be a creator to create the creation. Amen. Amen. That's it. The very reason that you're here tonight 
the very reason that this meeting's going on proves that there's a fountain open somewhere of divine healing. Hungry hearts. I stood in Africa recently where we had 30,000 converts one afternoon. See, 25,000 healed at one time, seven van loads long as across this building almost go away. Next morning there stood 25,000 people walking down the streets for their crutches and everything laying in there and old cots and things that brought them in, walking down the different tribes, associating together, saying, and only believe all things are possible. And the mayor of the city and I stood in the hotel there and just cried like babies to see them blanket natives the day before didn't know which is right and left handed. Here they was, lovely Christians. He knew by the power of God in one moment of time. Why? They seen something happen. And as soon as they seen it happen, something sprung to them. And they said, it's me too. And when they had the opportunity, all right. they accepted it in a way they went. That's all there is to it. See? There first has to be a, a creation or creator to create a creation to make you long and believe in God. Amen. And when it does, as sure as you believe in that, that shows there's a fountain of divine healing somewhere. That's right. It's got to be. Amen. And the Bible speaks and says that it's His. It's His Holy Spirit that leads you. The same Holy Spirit that lead, led Simeon to believe that is the same Holy Spirit that leads you to believe in divine healing. No two Holy Spirits. Just one. That same Holy Spirit that revealed to him that he wasn't going to die until he seen the Lord's Christ. That same Holy Spirit speaks to you. There is a power of God that heals the sick. See? Oh, is it plain? It's, well, you couldn't make it any plain. See? There is a power of God that heals the sick. See? Well, the doctor said, I know the gentleman. That's very fine. I pray for them all the time. And I do not condemn the doctor. No, sir. He's a... He's God's servant, works on the people, but there's some things that he don't know, and some things that he can't do. Then if he can't do, let's go to the specialist, you see, the great one, the great specialist, the great physician, and go to him. He, we're invited to come. He asked us to come. He's looking for us to be there. That's right. He's expecting us, and that's the reason he's revealing himself to you. I'm the Lord, heals all thy diseases. I'm Jehovah uh, uh, Rapha, Jehovah the healer. The Lord heals all thy diseases. Something tells you in your heart, that's right, I believe that. Well, that's the same Holy Ghost that said, Simeon, you're not going to see death until you see the Lord's Christ. Amen. How many sick people here believe you're going to get healed during this meeting? Raise your hand. Say, I, I believe I'm going to get healed, my loved ones and so forth. You're going to be healed, all right? That's fine. See, something's revealed it to you. What? The same Holy Ghost. Are you expecting it? Amen. Expect it to happen? How many believe we're going to have a great meeting? Raise your hand. Say, I believe we're going to All right. See? So do I. See? What is it? Holy Spirit revealed it to us. Amen. I believe we're going to see the power of God. Don't you believe that? Sure. Holy Spirit reveals it to us. We, we believe that. And we just stay right with that. Now, you know they didn't have television then. They thank God for that. So then they um, they come. Um, I'm, I believe in pure holiness. I certainly do. I believe in really. I'm, you say, hear me say, I was a Baptist a while ago. I'm a Pentecostal Baptist. So we, and I'm a Baptist that received the Holy Ghost. That's right. I believe in old-fashioned, Pentecostal, sky-blue, sin-killing religion. Yes, sir. I believe in being gun barrel straight and preaching the same way. You live it the way you preach. You just jump as high as you live. That's just right. If you think to uh, live very high, then don't jump very high. <laughs> just, uh, make your jump equal with your life. And I believe that should be that way. That's when God will honor His Word. It, it's, it's either right or wrong. And I, I believe that God said prove all things and it's proved to me that it's right. So I believe it. Amen. Now, notice this. I want to ask something. Now, not to begin the, the ministers are the ones to do the preaching. I come here for healing service. But I want to ask something in the face of civilization and all fairness and facts. Do you notice our women in Pentecost and everywhere else? Each year take off a little bit more clothes. A little bit more clothes. That's a right. Bit more clothes. Until they become to almost, it's a disgrace. Amen. Now, we can expect that our people out of the world, they don't know no difference. But there are Pentecostal people. And I want to say something. I stood there where I seen 30,000 blanket natives receive Jesus Christ at one time. Them women stand there just as naked as they come in the world, young and old. Nothing but a little cloud of beads hanging in front of them about that big. Never know they were naked, know nothing about it. And right on the ground where they seen this healing taking place in this sign it as I go into it more tomorrow night. You see that taking place. Uh, they, wanted to they wanted something 
want to receive Christ. And I said, I uh, ask all that believes that he will save you. Let them stand up. And, uh, 30, 000, well, they tagged 30,000. I don't know how many stood, but 30,000 stood up. And then, and Brother Bosworth and them said, I believe Brother Brandon that they meant physically. And I said, I did not mean, had 15 interpreters, you know. So I said, I did not mean physical healing. I meant salvation that you... You accept Christ, God's Son, as your personal Savior, and you want to serve Him. Many of with idols in their hand. I said, you that's sincere about it, break your idols on the ground like a dust storm. and said, go up like that. And as soon as they received Christ, that naked women, brother, sister, they folded their arms like this to walk out of presence in man. And if a raw heathen that knows not right and left hand as soon as Christ touches them, realize that they're naked, and then we claim to be of the church of the living God and stripping ourselves every year? It don't make sense to me. There's something wrong somewhere. Right. Amen. Oh, God. Yeah, we're in Lady Osea. That's where we're at. We're, we're way down the line. Here's the coming of the Lord Jesus. Oh, let's be ready to meet Him. Yes. Yes, Simeon, as I said, they didn't have the televisions. <laughs> While I was on that, I made a remark, something on that one time, and as a lady said to me, and talked about the way women dress themselves in the little farm fitting clothes and things. And so she said, uh, said why? Well, I said, if you do that, you'll answer at the day of judgment for committing adultery. Yes, and somebody called my hand on it. I said, Jesus said, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And you might be as pure as a lily to your husband or your sweetheart. You might be just as virtuous a woman as there is in the United States. You're just as virtuous as you was when you come from your mother's womb. But lady, if you dress yourself like that to let sinners look at you like that, he's going to lust after you. And when he does, at the day of the judgment, when he answers for his adultery, you're the one who presented yourself to him. Amen. There you are. So you're going to answer for committing Amen. adultery. Some of them said to me, said, well, Brother Ram, that's the only kind of clothes they make. I said, they still got sewing machines and sell goods before it's used to it. It's just the thing. That's right. We, what we need today is a good old-fashioned, sky-free, sin-killing religion, an old St. Paul's revival and the Bible of Holy Ghost, and back to real Pentecostal messages again. Back to the truth. What it is today, right. so many of the bashes in the field evangelism becomes a meal ticket to them. It has this big program to sponsor, and they can't say that before the church. Some minister told me, said, you're going to ruin your ministry with that. I said, any minister the word of God will ruin, ought to be ruined and kicked out. Anyhow, yes, sir. I said, I, that's right. You don't, uh, what we need is back to the Bible, back to real holiness, back to God, back, back to where people can have faith. How can God build his church up on a foundation like that? We cut our churches and made organizations and we belong to them and settle right down like the rest. And now we used to say the old cold formal Baptists and now the Baptists say you cold formal Pentecostal. That's right. That's exactly right. Pentecostal more formal than the Baptists. Yes, sir. So there we are. What we want is a good old fashioned shaking revival across this country. Bring men and women back to God. Why, the church is in better condition for Jesus to come 40 years ago than it is today. Back when they had real Pentecost amongst the people. But today right. we've weakened our way in our pulpits. Has got weakened. Four or five rounds of little uh, seminary ministers has come in with kinky hair, you know, or what? I'm not saying anything about that because I haven't got any. But that don't make me. But what I mean to say, they get that in your face, just like God had grandchildren. God don't have no grandchildren. Uh, you know, Methodist. If you're a Methodist and born again, you're son of God. But what do you find? Wesley come along. The first round of Methodists was fine. Second round, they get to bring in their children. That's the same thing the Pentecostals did. A few years ago, they had real Pentecost. Men and women who got out the altar and paid the price and come through, brother, and live the life. Yes, sir. Well, what they do? They brought their children in, set them on the rows, and dedicate them in the church, and they were Pentecostal. That's grandchildren. There's no place in the Bible where God's got grandchildren. He ain't grandpa. He's God. He's Father. Hallelujah. And every man and woman, I don't care how you know, how good your father and mother was, you've got to have that same experience of being born again if you're the Holy Ghost. You're expected to be a son and daughter of God. Right. This is the word Pentecost will say. Pentecost is not an organization. Pentecost is an experience to whosoever will. Let him come and drink from the fountain of the water of life. Amen. Now that's true, friend. That's sassaras, is it? Do you have sassaras up here? Yeah. All right, you know what I mean. I said that one time. Someone said, somebody wrote me some letters. There, what's sassaras? All right, but you know what it is up here. 
Yes, sir. Oh, but brother, I'll tell you, it, it, it'll straighten you out. It'll, it'll make you live right. That's true. Just get down there and stay till it's over. And get straightened out with God. Yes, and Simeon, in them days, he was, had that promise and he was believing it with all his heart. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. The wise man came and didn't have the newspapers. And eight days later, the mother came to the temple for offer of the turtle doves or pigeons for the purification and circumcision of the child. And now here comes Jesus. Now I'm closing. Here comes Jesus, his first time in the temple, in the arms of his little mother. They tell me his swaddling cloth was made out of a, uh, the wrapping that went on the back of a yoke of an ox that was hanging in the stable. And then we can put on a, a $500 meat coat and sticker that holds up in the air if it's drowned in rain. So I think we're somebody in our Savior, the God of heaven, came and wrapped in his swaddling cloth. The foxes had dens and the birds had nests, but the Son of Man had not a place to lay his and then we think we're somebody can drive a car better than the Joneses and just starve our kids to death there to get that car, too. Or get a better television or something. Stay home on Wednesday night from prayer meeting and let the church sit vacant to watch We Love Susie or something like that. That's nonsense on the television. That shows how much you love God. I'll tell you, brother, that what we need to revive, that's just exactly that's what the church needs to get back to God. Yes, sir. When you, you show up, your action shows what it is. People's action shows. Just as that. You love the world, the things of the world, the Bible says the love of God's not even in you. That's right. Or you join the church, that's right. But this is what we're talking about. You don't join this until you're born into it. I've been in the Brandon family 51 years. They would ask me to join the family. Why? Well, I was born in it. I, I was a Brandon of birth. That's what you are, a Christian. You're born into the church of the living God. You're born into it by birth. You're a Christian by birth. Now, Jesus came into the temple. Now, I can imagine those mothers in them days, you know, all of them up there, the little babies with their little booties and their little needlework, you know, and all done their little fancy blankets and the society women, you know, talking about. And first thing you know, in come little Mary, packing this little baby with this swatman clothes. Wrapped around him from the yoke of an ox. Well, I, I hear someone say, look there, see that holy roller? Or, uh, you know, I don't maybe that's wrong. But I'll say, say, look at that woman. You know what? She married that baby is born out of holy wedlock. Mm, don't tell me. Where is the little smoke? Is down to be some fire somewhere? Yes, sir. I'll tell you, boy. That's all there is to it. Yeah, I'll tell you. She's one of them. You better watch her. See? Keep your distance from her. That's the way the lukewarm believer tries to do to the real believer. Oh, he lost his mind. He went off on the deep end. There's something wrong. I trust God for this. He said, oh, the days of miracles is past. No such thing as divine healing. Mm. All right. But in her little heart, she knows who that baby belongs to. She knows. And so is every man that's born in the Spirit of God. He knows where he stands. He knows what revelation, who gave him that revelation. If Paul said, I'll never come to you preaching you enticing words of man and that your wisdom, but that your faith would be built in the wisdom of man, but I'll come preaching to you the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's it, brother. Simple and plain, just plain to believe it. That's all. God said so, and that's settled. That's that's the whole thing. She knows who that baby belongs to. No matter what the address of night, she say, hey, keep your distance. Don't go around. Don't have nothing to do with her. She's just keep away from her. She didn't care whether they did or not. Just make her okay. Yeah, she knows who this baby belongs to. Yeah, she knows who That's right. She knows what when you got the Holy Ghost. She knows what happened. You, you know where it comes from. <laughs> did it come from some seminary or cemetery? <laughs> well, both got the same dead places, so they never So then she knew where this baby comes from. She walks and said, Yes, sir. She, you know, she went walking on like that, out there on pension, talking to her baby. She didn't have time to associate with them all in society. That's what's married our church today. They got the Ladies' society, the man's society, this society, ball games, soup suppers, and everything else. And prayer meetings he left off, you know, no more. And the Holy Ghost promised he had only sealed those who sighed and cried for the abominations done in the city. There's you hey. Could you mark out on your hand ten people tonight in this city to sign and cry day and night for the wickedness and things that done in the city? Does anybody in this audience know where you put your fingers on? Five people that sigh and cry day and night for the sins and things. Well, now the Bible said, set a mark up on those who sigh and cry for the abomination in the city. That's right. That's it. See, no more burden for lost souls. It's all gone. We join church and settle down. It's all necessary. 
See, that's how we get. It's so, sin is so sneaky. It sneaks out of the door before you know it. That's what it does. It just grabs it like the old toboggan slide used to be. And it's got you. The devil does that. Now, brother, let's get, come back off of his territory. Let's come back to God. Come back to the altar. Rebuild the altar again. It's been torn down. And <clears throat> build up your home. Take them cards off the table and all the old love story magazines. And open up the Bible. And read the Bible. And pray. Just don't get out and say, bless my family, Mary, Joel, and John, and all of them. Get in the bed. No, sir. Stay there with God. Oh, my. You know all the song you sing? There are times I'd like to be all alone with Christ and Lord. I can tell him all my troubles all alone. That's what we need again. That's for that kind of meetings, that kind of a church. That's the kind of church that prays down to the blessings of God. I'm sure your pastor would appreciate every member becoming like that. How it, and how it would be if the church could just be like that again. And now, she's coming along with this baby. Now, there's Christ in the temple. All right? If Christ was in the temple and God had revealed it to Simeon, that it was, uh, he's going to show him the Christ before he died. Well, I think if Christ is in the temple, it's time for the Holy Spirit to go to work on Simeon. Don't you think so? Let's think it's Monday morning. Uh, how many little babies would be born? It's about two and a half million people in Israel then. And I suppose there would be at least uh, hundreds of babies born every night. And every eight days they had to be circumcised and offered a purification. All right. Here they are now. It's Monday morning. All, Simeon's back in the office of reading the scrolls. Let's see. He picks up Isaiah. And he begins to read down to Isaiah 9 and 6. And to us a child is born, a son is given his name shall be called Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Governor shall be on his shores. No. Oh, who could that be? About that time the Holy Spirit said, Rise up, Simeon. Rise up. What do you want me to do? Just rise up? Well, where shall I go? No, no, just stand up. That's all I want you to do. That's what God wants you to do. Just as he speaks, clap. That's what you want to do this week. When God speaks, act. Good. Say, go see so-and-so about coming to church. Act. Good. Stand up. That's all. You're right. What next? Start walking. Where about? Walk. I'm going to do the lead and you do the Amen. walk. Amen. Here he comes. I see him coming out and Well, I know this is the Holy Ghost. Because he's talked to me before. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know what I mean, don't you? Yeah. You be sons of God or led to the Spirit of God. Yeah. 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 Here he comes walking. Walking through the temple. Not knowing where he's going. Just led by the Holy Ghost. Not comes over and goes down through thousands of people everywhere. Here he hits this line of circumcision of the children. Coming walking right down along this line. He sees this little woman everybody's keeping their distance from. He walks up. The Holy Spirit begins to make his heart beat real fast, you know. Oh, he leads you to the promise, yes. If he gives you the promise and you believe in divine healing, he leads you right into it. If you believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he leads you right into it. Where is that? He'll lead you right to it. Now, he's got him right here beside him. Simeon reaches over, takes that baby out of his mother's arm, raises up his hand, and says, God, let your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. Way back over the corner, an old blind woman named Anne. She was a prophetess. Anne was a prophetess. She'd been blind for years. She sat there and she also waited and believed on the consolation of Israel. She believed that that prophet was coming. And she was believing. She was standing there and the Holy Ghost said, Anna, stand up. Amen. Those that are spiritual are always led to the right time. Stand up, Anna. And here comes this old blind woman. But pardon me, sir. Pardon me, madam. I'm sorry. Led by the Holy Spirit. Where are you going, Anna? I don't know. I'm just led. First thing you know, she comes right straight to where Simeon is standing there saying, Lord, let thy servant depart in peace. And she likewise, the Holy Ghost come upon her, and she begin to prophesy about the child. Amen. Oh, brother and sister, if the Holy Ghost could lead a blind man, how much ought he to lead us, although we are becoming blind, let him lead us back to the fountain. For there is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners come to peace of blood. You believe that? God bless you. Are you expecting something to happen? That time is gone. Now, if you're such a lovely audience, I can speak an hour yet to you. But my time is up. And let's be expecting God to give us a great revival. Will you, will you join with me in prayer to, for that purpose? Will you do it? Let's bow our heads.
Mr. Brother, and I know you all are expecting it. We're here to work together as a unit of God. Let nothing stand in our way now. Church, we're here to work with you, all you ones that have flown to the assemblies of God and the church of God and the United Pentecostals and whatever you might be. We don't care what brand you wear. We're just, just believing that God will do it. Let's join together now with one call. Our Heavenly Father, these broken up words and little talk here just to kind of get all the fear and starchiness away from your church. Just to kind of break up the polygram. To lay a foundation here, or not lay a foundation, but to build up all the foundations all ready to lay in Christ Jesus. What these people have been taught to believe down through the years. That Jesus Christ is Son of God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we join our hearts and our prayers together. The Bible said in the fourth chapter of I believe of the Acts of the Apostles when the people had come together and made a report. Then they prayed with one accord and the building was shut where they were sent together. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Oh God, we go along here today with this wonderful name pinned up on us as Pentecostal believers. Witnessing that we've been born again of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit leads us. And then Lord, we see the church getting weakened and falling away and crumbling down. Oh God, uh, what a, what a condition. Revive us, O Lord. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and bring forth the refreshing, the do gospel of mercy from above. O God, revive our, our, our community here. Revive the whole city. Revive the churches around. Revive the Methodists. Revive the Baptists. Revive all of them, Lord. And O God, may it begin right here in this congregation. May there be such a reviving and awakening among us, Lord, the Holy Ghost taking our hearts and tearing us apart and squeezing from us uh, the precious ointment that He would desire uh, for our church to be anointed with. Grant it, Lord. Bless us now. Forgive us of our sins, our shortcomings. God, may there not be a sick person in the this meeting with what will be healed. Grant it, Lord. May there not be one person that's sinful or unbeliever ever come to this meeting, but what will be saved? Grant it, Lord. May the angels of God go to every church, to that every community, every place, down to the barrooms, and, and bring conviction upon the sinners. And may the Christians go forth testifying, saying, Come see, come see. We've never seen anything like it. Grant it, Lord. May it be a great roar through this country, and God getting glory out of it. Grant it, Father. Bless your precious shepherds. I ask again, Father, standing up here on the platform, some I've never seen in my life. But Lord God, if they're standing here to make a witness that they too are believers. They're here to, to put in their part, to put their shoulder to the wheel. Our hearts are burning and yearning, Lord, to see the Spirit of God move among us. Grant it. Do this for us, Father. We commit ourselves to you in Christ's name. For his glory we ask it. Now, all that's in here that's sick and needy, raise up your hands right now. Just raise up your hands. All right? I want you to lay your hands over on one another. Just lay your hands over on each other. So, now, don't pray for yourself. You pray for the person that you got your hand on. They're praying for you. Um, I like that. All things are possible. Now, in, in our hearts, let's just think now. I can see a... A bunch of disciples around a, a boy with epilepsy. I hear Andrew say, uh, step back, boys. I, I'll show you how I've done it down at the dream. When I cast out epilepsy down, like, here's the way I've done it. But it didn't work. Simon Peter steps up and said, well, like, here's the way I've done it down at Joppa. I'll show you how I've done it down there. And it didn't work. But they have to look coming down the hill. There come one walking quietly. Maybe you're not a big giant looking man that says no beauty we should desire. Him. But there's something about him. He knows what he was speaking of. And he ran to him, his father, the child, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's very subject to the devil. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not carry him. Jesus said, I can if you believe for all things are possible. Said, Lord, I believe you helped out on my feet. All right. That same man, when he left the world, our Savior, the last words he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. These signs shall follow them and believe. 
The last sign he said, he said, they shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. Now there's a believer, got their hands laying on you. A believer that believes in healing. Jesus made the statement, these signs shall follow them, believers. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now if you believe with all your heart, don't doubt that if you pray the prayer of faith, then the one that you have your hands on is praying for you, I believe. Our Heavenly Father, we lay our hands by faith upon the sick and the afflicted and ask that your grace and mercy will supply everything that they have need of. They're praying, Lord, just the way they do. They love you and they believe you. I pray, Heavenly Father, with all my heart that you'll break every fetter of unbelief. Cast away every evil spirit. May they not be able to stand in the building, Lord. Right away. May nothing but the pure, unadulterated faith in God be in every heart just now. May the devil be defeated in our lives. And we know he is defeated because he is the defeated being. And Satan, I turn to you now to say this, that you are defeated. You're not afraid of us, but you're afraid of the one that we're speaking about. You have lost every bit of power you ever had. You were defeated at Calvary. Jesus Christ, God's Son, triumphed over every enemy. He conquered all sickness, all death, hell and the grave, and conquered every victory that you ever had. And you're nothing but the blood. And we're calling your blood tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, turn these people loose. They're holy, following, and expecting to be healed. Power of God present. Believe it with your hands laid on one another. Satan, leave them. Come out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. You lose to that. And they shall be well because God said so. God promised it. We're expecting it. And we know it shall be so. For Satan is defeated. And God has friends. We know that it's so. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name for it to be so. For God's will be. And just stay shut in with God. Just keep believing now with all your heart. Lord, I believe that you heal me right now. I believe because I laid my hand on this man here, he laid his hand on me, on this woman, she laid her hand on me. I was led to do that. I was led to lay my hand on this person. They were led to lay their hands on me. The same Holy Ghost that told sin and gave him the promise led me to do this while we're right here in this place of divine healing. Now I'm believing, Lord. Satan, you might as well get away from me right now because I'm taking, I'm a seed of Abraham by Jesus Christ. And I take the friend. Just keep believing with all your heart. While I ask one of our pastors here, the one the one of the brethren here, if you will, if you'll come all for prayer, some one of the pastors here, come take the service over one of you here. All right, sir. I'm so I just keep yourself shut in just a few moments with God. I want to ask you now, as you move your hands back to one another and say, I believe and I take him right now as my healer, and no matter what Satan ever tries to tell me, I'm going to believe that God makes me well. Raise up your hands. Say, I now accept it. God bless you. That's the way to do it. Keep that kind of faith going and you'll see the exceedingly abundantly above all that we can even do or think. Until I see you tomorrow night, here's the pastor. God bless you.